That's assembly, by the way. Welcome to Forex Start Today. Let me remind you that trading is risky, not appropriate for everyone. Your past performance, good or bad, is not necessarily indicative of future results. Stay small, stay humble, focus on the long term. Never to lose money, can't afford to lose. Sorry, yes, yeah, sir. Get down and give me 20 pips. Sorry, yes, sir. Those are the days, huh? Hey, welcome to, uh, to Trader's Way, or thank you. Hello. I guess I'm off already. Welcome to Forex Talk today. My name is Wayne. I am the Chief FX Market Strategist for TradersWay.com. There we are. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you for being a client. We appreciate you. I'm here 7.30 in the morning or 8. I've been dabbling on for half an hour. No, it's not cocaine. It's lack of sleep and too much caffeine and too many rock stars. But I, still, I am here. I'm alive and I am focused. 7.30 a.m. Monday through Friday here at Forex Start Today. I'm here to teach you technical analysis, fundamental analysis, teach you patience, discipline, that kind of thing. Analysis of forethought, risk management, all this kind of stuff. Next Friday, however, not, not today, one week from today, I'll be at fxstreet.com posting trade non-firm payrolls live. I've been doing that for about 12 years. Um, FX Street is a big site, and that webinar is their number one webinar. It has been for forever. So that's cool. So I break away for that. Let's do some technical analysis. All right. Start with the big dog. If you recall yesterday, I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. What do you do when you're at like R4? I don't know. There's a reason I didn't put it in my book. It doesn't happen that often, like R4. There isn't even an R4, is there? There was a time uh, many years ago when I was watching VIX, you know, VIX was down at, you know, if it was down at nine, it was probably time to, to sell or something. And if it went to 15, that was really bad. And then one day it went to 80. And I'm like, 80? Is there even an 80? Like, 80? I don't have 80 on my chart. Like, 15 was bad. What's 80? Right? You know, it's, it's on a scope and scale of never seen before. So you're just like, what do you do? You know, I don't know. Shoot some zombies or something, right? So, uh, you know, like, when was the last time this sucker was at R4? Well, this one almost made it, almost made it to R3, right? But R4, like, holy smokes. Uh, the answer is never. So you have to be a confident enough person to say, I don't know what to do here. Right? You have to be confident to recognize or admit your mistakes. So in one of my classes at Harvard, we were discussing um, hospital management of doctors. It turned out they found that experienced doctors that worked in, in teams for years made way more mistakes than other teams. And, and interviewing the, the these experienced doctors they say well why are you guys you know why are there so many mistakes and they're like well we just trust each other so the the hospital administrators which are probably a lot like government workers said well okay they trust e each other so they're not actually overseeing each other's work and they're making horrible mistakes out of laziness or something right so the, the hospitals decide to break up all these experienced teams that trust each other. And what do you think happened? Did the mistakes improve or get worse? It 
it gets worse. What is the point of my topic right here? That you have to be confident to admit you're wrong or you admit a mistake or you're confident enough to say, I don't know what happens up here. So it turns out confident doctors that work in teams that are experienced and trust each other are confident enough to report their errors. And people that are not confident, or doctors that are not confident, hide their errors. They're ashamed of their errors. They're, they pretend they didn't happen. They wipe them under, under the carpet. Hope, oh, I hope nobody, nobody noticed. noticed I just did that, right? I'll cut him open and pull the sponge up, but I'm not going to report it because I might get into trouble. Where a confident doctor is like, I made that mistake. I'm going in. I'm going to fix this. And I apologize because you're confident. So I'm up here at R4, and I said this yesterday. I don't know. I don't know what happens here. But I have to be confident enough to say in front of the group of people I'm here to teach, I don't know what to do here. But it takes this level of confidence to say I'm your mentor, but I don't know. 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 And sure enough, well, it came down. Well, great. Good. I mean, that's great because it's really hot, right? Right. Well, that, that is the point, right? That you have to be honest with themselves, but eventually you're going to have a, a, an investor sit down with you. And you know what you, what you are supposed to do when you sit down with an investor? You don't talk them in investing with you at least in the United States you're supposed to get you know, so here's what I do I, I take everything extreme right I will give them three reasons not to invest let me tell you why you shouldn't put your money in with me now does that sound like an unconfident person Look, this is really risky. It might not be appropriate for you. Let's talk about it. There's all kinds of things that can happen here. It's unlikely, but even the broker could go out of business. This has happened. I've seen it. I've been around so long. I've seen everything. Usually what happens is a trader could just go crazy with leverage, right? Or feel like they're not going to make the big bonus by the end of the year, so they overtrade to try to make it up, and the whole thing collapses. These things happen. This is how hedge funds blow up. It happens all the time. But luckily, I have a risk management approach that prevents all of this. But we should talk about it because it could happen. It's still real. Humans make mistakes. Ego gets involved. Emotion gets involved. But you should know that it's a prime part of our culture at Sound Effects Capital Management that we trade with your best interest in mind. We're not trying to hunt down our year-end bonuses because that's self-interested. So let's talk about how that works. And by the way, that's in the disclosure document. Let me show you. On page 62, it really goes over here. And I put this paragraph in um, not because it's legally required, but because it's plainer language. And let me just show you right here how it talks about that risk right I love doing things like going through a disclosure document this is where things could go wrong look at this other one things can go wrong here let's go through it much more confident so you have to be transparent but you have to be confident like when I when I used to do venture capital stuff can you imagine if you're an entrepreneur and you had ghosts in your closet and then you went to talk to investors? They're going to do FBI background checks on you, brother, and you're, you're going to hide it. As soon as you hide it, you're dead. you got to be open. If people are going to give you millions of dollars, you better be as transparent as a ghost. You know what I mean? So anyways, yeah, I'm up here. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. I don't have experience at R4. I've been doing this for 15 years. 
I don't have experience at R4. I don't know what happens. That's an increased amount of risk. So if you're going to trade that, you better manage that risk. Maybe it keeps going up forever. That's great. Maybe it collapses on us fast and quick. Because usually it's walking up the stairs and jumping off the top of the building, right? Walking up the stairs takes a long time. Jumping off the building comes down real fast. So you just got to manage, you, you manage your stops and stuff like that, right? So anyways, that's a very important thing. Uh, in particular, as Ted said, to be transparent to yourself because how could you possibly improve if you're not looking for your mistakes? Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry, Adam. I'll change that today. Okay. All of these are super elevated. What are you going to do? Check the, check the weeklies. Everything's just out of control. Out of control. Same scenario. Uh, Barry, we typically start at 7.30 in the morning. Well, so Ryan says, if you don't know what to do, then don't do anything. Well, let's let's expand on that because I think you're correct. But let's, let's expand on that a little bit. If you're not certain you're going to make money, then don't trade. You have to have a clear plan. You should, I've told you this before. You should be shocked if you don't make money. You're like, what? Didn't make any money? What, what the heck happened here? So, like, what do you do? Do you just, do you do things like, oh, that's so overbought, it can't go any higher. I'll sell this. Well, that doesn't seem certain, <laughs> right? Oh, just sell this. Look how elevated it is. You're going to sell an uptrend? Okay. That doesn't sound good to me. That doesn't sound like easy money, right? Like, where are you going to sell? It didn't even fall off a pivot, right? Well, then what do you do? Buy? Well, it's so overbought, right? So you'll want to buy here or you want to buy here off the 21. Those are the two areas. So which one do you do? And Both of those are, ah, I don't know. I, I'm, there are better, better trades, is what I'm saying. Because everything outside of normal is risky. And something that is elevating so fast, <clears throat> so quickly, you shouldn't sell. How many people know what a moo trade is? Moo trades are based on daily pivots. But we could talk about it on monthlies. I think the rule might, might because again, we're at R3, R4, this is so unusual that I don't know if this, but but anyways, a mood trade has to do with when you when you bust above daily pivots, what do you do? A bust below the daily pivots, what do you do? And what I say is you keep trading in that direction until the cows come home. And the cows come home at the end of the day. They go out to the field, they graze, and they come back to the, you know, they come back to the farm, come back to the barn, whatever. Um, at the end of the day, so I would say, well, you know, typically if you're up in an area like this, you're looking to take profit, but if you happen to be on a daily pivot and you're like up, down, and then it keeps going, just keep going with it. Just keep going and just don't worry. Something super unusual has happened today in the market that we're blowing the doors out of, of the pivots. Well, this is sort of like a mood trade where we hit our monthly target and it just kept going. You would never sell this, okay? You would never sell this under any circumstance because something ridiculous has happened to either the euro or the dollar, right? And of course, we know it's dollar, that you would just not trade against that, right? That's like choosing to jump into the tsunami 
because it looks like fun. You're probably going to drown. It's probably going to take you and sweep you away. It's a pretty scary thing. You don't want to jump. Just imagine that as current. That's money flowing. It's money flow. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna try to swim upstream, see if I can do it. No. Well, it doesn't matter. It could be pound, right? But the thing is, I, I tend to remind myself just, Get in it or get out of the way. You don't watch it fall in ice to be up. So it's a beautiful day. So I got out of oil, isn't that nice? Ugh. Took two bucks out of that sucker and then it collapsed. I must be the entire oil market. <laughs> Right, my one fifth of an oil contract, boom, rock the market. That's it. I'm taking my point two, and I'm out of here. But it was something, anyways. So I, I bought. There was a break and pullback, and I dumped it up here. I thought I bought it at like sixty four to sixty six. Was it? Can't remember. About two bucks, though. Happy with that. That that's indicative of uh, Canadian dollar wimping out soon, and uh, it's had a little hiccup and it's a little drop. But is that tradable? Chuck, how do you trade a breakout? Oh, well, Monday, yeah, you could have swung it. But the problem is it's hard to swing in a range because you don't know which way. You could still take it, you know, if you're a bull on cat or a bull on oil. So, And I did buy oil. So I, I essentially broke this through oil, not through the cat. Yeah, so it's a roll reversal. You got a perfect shot. So... You see these double blue lines above and double blue lines be below. So three or four weeks ago, I drew these for us. This is the top of the range. This is the bottom of the range. And I was really indifferent. I was really neutral in this, right? Let it go away. It's a beautiful... Let it go away. Yeah, it could have been done. Yeah, yeah, well, but you're doing this on Thursday, not Tuesday. There's a difference, right? Oops. Yeah, it's not easy, but it's it's there. I'm trying to get to the right time frame here. Right, so this is how I had it. Uh no, I had it more like that must have been a different one. Okay. I think we had it like that. It's a breakout. You're riding the 21. Yeah, I, I, I know it's it's a trickier one. For show. Well, no, you're not wrong, Ryan. It is trickier. Um, 
it's one of these things like it doesn't mean you don't do it or no, I should say it doesn't mean you can't take that trade but it does mean there's a, an elevated level of risk that you need to manage for that trade so you can say well I can see the breakout I can see the pullback to the 21 I can see the Fibonacci I can see them right but the monthly and weekly pivot clusters are a concern to me so I'm going to have to manage my stop a little more closely on the entry maybe move my stop a little more quickly than I, I typically would on on this trade you know instead of waiting for 50 pips maybe you wait for 25 pips and jam your stop and take a walk right and you're like I'm only going to risk 25 pips on this one typically I would risk 50 right that kind of thing and because you got to you have to trade to make money right at the end of the day you can say well I'm so conservative I never trade but therefore I have a perfect track record so I would rather you say I recognize the risk on this one and I will make appropriate risk management choices what if what if instead of you left the stop at 50 pips but you cut your lot size in half you're like well this one's only worth half instead of one standard lot i'm only putting five minis on this because of the risk that you recognize in this trade setup okay Yeah, but you know, perhaps you're you're breaking through that stage where you are now, where you recognize the risk and not sure what to do, so doing nothing better than losing, which is cool, right? And you're getting years of experience under your belt. Well, just imagine like another year of doing this. You'll probably be better in that situation because you'll see it more often, and you'll see when it does. You're like when it does rally up and knock you out and you were right to stay out of the trade but you'll also have more experience of watching the trades take off and make money even though you stayed out and you'll say well so you should be asking your, yourself these little more I don't know philosophical but I guess harder questions to answer like why and I found I spent a lot of time doing that kind of stuff like why is it that in certain situations it rallies up and knocks my short trade out for a loss and I saw the potential but why does it do it on some occasions but why does it like take off and I and I left money on the table like what was the difference between the two which means you have to track these things and then I recognize like oh my god I hit the pivot profit zone on Tuesday and it rallied up but if I hit it on Friday it busts out because we're already trading next week and I'm like oh so that might be it that might matter when I hit the pivot profit zone matter so all of a sudden I'm looking for every occasion I hit the pivot profit zone early in the period and I'm trying to find other situations where I'm hitting the pivot profit zone late in the period, whether it's a day, a week, or a month, right? And I try to stack these up and I print them out and I waste like five toners with your toner cartridges printing all these suckers out. And now I got like, okay, I got 27 of these, right? And, uh, and 19 of these just because that's all I found. And I go through and like, what is the propensity for the early weeks to rally break out? versus the late in the period rally, you know, retrace or break. And I'm like, well, son of a gun. And I start to see these things. But that's what makes you a better trader though, right? So I'll I'll do stuff like that. But what I what I've been telling you over these years, you need to break your trading down to very, very small digestible pieces and then master that right so I'm very clear on what I know 
but I'm also very clear in what I don't know. So when we're up at the R4, I'm like, I don't know. I haven't done that. I haven't researched it. I haven't found enough instances in the last 15 years for me to study that. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I need to look at that. Didn't even map R4, yet alone R3 I don't even understand. So R4, what, there's an R4? <laughs> is there an R9? I mean, of course there is, but how many R9s I probably never hit, right? So I feel comfortable being honest with you. I'm like, I don't know what to do there. I don't know. Have fun. But to me, that's risky. Like, I want the low-hanging fruit. Right in my book, I talk about the 800-pound gorilla and the cheeky little monkeys. The big gorilla has got all his bananas. He's so fat and lazy, and he's dropping everything around. Oh, I got all these bananas. Got to be the cheeky little monkey. All right. Uh, brand. We got GDP coming up. GDP. Guess I got to go do a dollar then, don't I? Okay, 2.6. Inventory's down, too. Down, to It's about 4% month about the 10th worth in the expectations. Year and even line at once about 9%. Just wrapping up the U.S. data, the wholesale inventory is coming in. Zero is about 2%, two tenths below. Again, a miss there on the headline GDP for Q4, coming in at 2 spot 6%. That was four tenths below. And up a beat there on the personal consumption and a beat there on durable goods. The dollar... A little bit weaker here, 124.52 currently being traded. The 10-year yield is slightly lower, 2 spot 63, around 2 spot 64 just before the data. So lower yield, slightly weaker dollar post data. Wow, look at that one, huh? Oh. Talk about Wikipedia, huh? Oh. Well, if you have a closed border, you would have a strong dollar. So his advisors or his philosophy is to close the borders, which would create a strong dollar. See, again, if I'm filthy, stinking rich, I, and I look around, I'm like, well, I can buy, um, how do I say it? I can pay an American, right? But Americans are filthy, stinking rich, so I have to pay them a lot of money. Plus, you know, you got to feed these suckers, and they eat more more food than a lion. So you're like, I don't want to hire an American, <laughs> right? So I'll hire a foreigner who will work cheap. Okay, so in this situation, let's let's pick on South Africa. <laughs> Let me do it. I'll pick on South Africa. I can just hire someone in South Africa to work for me, right? I'll probably pay the South African a lot less than I pay an American to do the exact same job. So my dollars go to South Africa. My dollars enter the foreign exchange market, the, the interbanking market system. And I exchange them for RAND. So demand for RAND goes up, and the supply of dollars goes up, which means an increase in supply devalues the currency. An increase in demand for, for a 
will increase the value of the currency. So by me hiring a South African, it weakens the dollar and strengthens the rand. So if I can't do that, if I'm not allowed to like buy foreign goods or hire foreign workers because our borders are closed, then the dollar is not likely to be weak. Okay? And by doing so, then foreigners will look at our stuff and say, wow. The dollar's strong, and it's going to cost me twice as much to buy a U.S. car than a foreign car. Like, let's say you're, you're German or something, right? You're like, let's see. Should I buy the Camaro or the Porsche? Right? The Porsche. <laughs> and you're like, well, the Camaro is twice as expensive. Well, let me tell you, it ain't twice as good. Or even half as good. So you're like, Why I'm going to just buy the Porsche. That's what the German, right? Should should the German buy the Camaro? Nine, right? So that's what happens. And all of a sudden, so there's just these closed borders, and the Americans trading with each other, and there's no supply of dollars globally. So that would make sense for for Trump. But why would you want a strong dollar if you can't buy anything from a foreigner? You know, I was thinking in the in the fundamentals course because I'm going to add two or three more hours worth of stuff. I'm wondering if we should do like absolute value, relative value, uh, trade, uh, international trade calculations and stuff. Right? Would you like stuff like that? So it'd be like you have two economies. Um, yeah, how about this? Real simple. Two economies, uh, Canada and the United States, let's say. And we only produce, each country only produces two goods apples and oranges. Super simple, right? Should they trade? Do you okay? Do you think the United States can produce more apples and oranges than Canada? Right. Well, there's twice as much land, right, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and climate and warmer seasons and stuff. But, so that's an absolute value. The United States can probably produce more apples, more oranges. It's not a bigger country, but it, it is a big country, but it's got warmer seasons and all that kind of stuff. And, and Canada's only got 25 million um, people. Uh, the United States is 350 million, right? So uh, more labor, more capital, all that kind of stuff, which increase, increases your productivity, all that kind of stuff, and technology. We all know this stuff. Great, 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 great. So is that it? Is it 34 million now? Wow, okay, so it's been a while since I've been there. Uh, right, it's all El Salvadorian and Haitian <laughs> immigrants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, I love Punjab. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the Punjabs are awesome. Uh, I, I, I've been there and fantastic people. Anyways, uh, so does can should Canada and the United States trade? But you so you can calculate, even though the United States has an absolute advantage, you could probably calculate that Canada might have an advantage, let's say per pound or per apple on apples 
and they probably don't have it on oranges. We're just guessing because of the climate and stuff. And there might be, if you can do the calculations properly, the United States probably would be better off, or let's say could be better off, buying can Canadian apples. Even though they can produce their own apples, they're like, wait, we're still better off buying Canadian apples because they can produce them per unit cheaper than what we could do. So at least we don't need to waste, li but let's say it only covers, you know, 20% of all the U.S. apples, but they should still buy the Canadian apples because at least it cuts their cost on the, on the 20%. And then you could use that extra land, let's say the 20% of your apple production could be repurposed to grow in something else. And maybe it's not apples and oranges, maybe it's wheat. And all of a sudden you're like, well, we have the same amount of apples, same amount of oranges, but now we also have wheat. And now we're better off, and Canada's better off, because now they sold our apples, and you know, we bought their apples, and they have money, and, and now they do things like buy our oranges, because they couldn't produce those oranges, and instead of trying to grow their own oranges, and, and, the, you know, and these calculations are really interesting, because uh, if you look at Latin America, or let's say Central America, uh, or let's say from 1950, uh, Trade balance to the beast. Let's say after World War II, uh, when the socialist pig dogs went in there and decided to say, hey, a closed economy, like Trump is, you know, talking about, a closed economy is so much better. Why don't, why should El Salvador make, you know, buy hot sauce from Honduras? El Salvador makes its own hot sauce and screw Hondurans, right? And they close their borders and do all this kind of stuff, but what happened to Central America? What happened to Honduras and El Salvador? Okay. And then tiptoe across the border, walk into Costa Rica, you're like, this place is beautiful. Yeah, well, it's an open economy. <laughs> Thank you. So terms of trade are important. Open borders are important for a lot of different reasons. So you can think of, well, how about you tell me one closed economy, one socialist pig dog closed economy that is better off? Which country? Over the history of the, of the 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 human species, which one which ones work best? Is there is there one? The Soviet Union? Shoot, it was twice the size of the United States. Did it work out? No. Yeah, Yugoslavia. Yeah, ended in war and genocide. China, well, you're talking communist, chi communist China versus capitalist China? Which China? Let me tell you, before the capitalist China, China sucked. Ask any Chinese person you meet and say, hey, what was the Chinese economy like 40 years ago? Okay, and then say, well, what was it like 20 years ago? And all of a sudden you're like, wow, things really started to change, right? And now it's booming, right? But the difference isn't, let's say, the political structure of whether you're communist or capitalist or socialist, like look in Norway, they're socialist big dogs, but they're rich. Well, they also have oil. Now take Sweden, you know. Um, fine. But it's the open borders that matter. Right? So go back to like when China entered the World Trade Organization. 
what was that? Uh, 99, 98, 97, 2001, I don't know, somewhere in there. And all of a sudden, 2001, thank you, Debisa. So just do this. Look at, you know, see if you can find documentaries or something. But uh, look at China in 1991. Ten years before WTO, they entered the. Uh, ten years before they dropped uh, their trade barriers, right? And then look at it, 2011, ten years after the drop of the trade barriers, and tell me the difference. You know, they're still communist. There's still the Communist Party in charge. The political system's the same. The economic system's the same. And you go from filthy stinking poor to filthy stinking rich in 20 years. Then look at, so, uh, look at South Korea before the Korean War, after the Korean War. Right? How about Taiwan? It's night and day. It's like, oh, my God. So, yeah, closing the borders, not a good idea. So maybe I'll throw that into the into the uh, fundamentals course where you can calculate the terms of trade. This economy should produce this and trade with that economy, which will produce that, and therefore both economies are going to be better off by this much. Therefore, demand and supply. That, what do you think? It, would that be a relevant hour to spend? Okay. All right. All right. So I haven't done that in a few years, but I'll think of that. I'll think of Because sometimes it's tricky, too. It's one of those topics, like, at first it gets easy, and then all of a sudden you're like, wait. Yeah, so. All right, so yeah, so this is the Canadian dollar, blah, 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 blah. Um, I watched yen because remember, I want the yen to get strong. So who knows what creates all these things, right? Who knows? Touch me. There's the role reversal we talked about uh, a day or two ago. So it depends on really how you've set this up, right? If you're a bear, this is where you'd want to sell. I haven't thought about it in years, but this, this pattern reminds me of a 90. Now, this is even older than my book, I think. So if my book is eight or nine years old, then this goes back 10, 12 years. There used to be something in FX boot camp 10, 12 years ago we called Not in a Million Years. And I haven't focused on that in so long. I don't even know if I still have this right. But it was an observation I had where uh, I talked about this Bollinger Band. You see how down it is? And I did this thing like, you know, how – often does it break above that I, I don't know if i have it quite right it's been so long but i i did a, a, a presentation where i'm like how many how often does it break above that and then i would say not in a million years 90 not in a million years i don't know if it's right anymore <laughs> but um it looked like it it just kind of struck me that that would happen based on 90. Okay, but I already have it marked. Like I said, I think I did this two days ago. I already have it marked. So whether it's not in a million years or not, if you're a bear, you should be looking to sell this. If you are a bear, you should be looking to sell this. If you are a bear, you should be looking to sell this. If you are a bear. If you are a bear. I don't know if you're a bear. So I'm not saying it's going to go down. 
saying if you're a bear, that's a resistance zone in which you would look to set up a short trade. What do you use? Are you going to take the 5A cross? Or are you going to make a double top? Or are you going to do the lower high? ADX, MACD, stochastics, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you're going to use, but are you going to set it up? So again, we're here now. So what is your trigger? And that is a personal matter. Are you looking for a 5A cross? How about down to the 21, up double bottom, down to the 55, up lower high, down to the 200, and then probably even a big retracement, and then down, down, down. I don't know. I don't know. They're all right. The value add that I can provide is that if you were a bear, that's where you would look to sell, and then how you sell is a personal matter. Right? That's between you, God, and your tax attorney. Not tax. Ta 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 what do you call it when you stuff a, an animal? Ta taxidermy? Yeah, not tax attorney. Your tax attorney. Yeah. What does this have to do with my stuffed pig? No, 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 no. All right. Gold. I have gold here somewhere, didn't I? Uh, I moved it up. Not tax dermy. Tax attorney. Uh, gold, huh? Where do we want to go? Search me and take me to another place. Oops. Do, do, do. What you don't have, you don't need it now. You don't need it now. Uh -oh. Okay. This is a cell zone. Up high would be better. So a three wave correction. One, two, three. Would be even better. It's a beautiful day to let it go away. Barry says the dollar is weak, so I wouldn't sell it. Doesn't mean it's going to be weak forever. I'm just telling you what the chart says. I'm not. I don't have opinions. Okay. And if you were bull, you already bought it. So. Right? And if you didn't buy it yet, then you're really running out of time. And where you're going to be challenged, Barry, even if you bought it. So let's say it comes down, you buy it here. Not bad. 618, roll reversal, pivot. Great. You're going to come up here. There are bears here, Barry. And that's the important news. I don't know if it's going to go up or down, but I know where people are going to trade. So you'll buy this and you'll think you're on the free and clear. And then, boom, slaughtered. Okay? Because there are bears there, and there are bears here, too. Okay? So, long story short, you can buy it here, here, or you sell it there and there. And the rest is just slack. Oh. Yeah, so I'm going to sign up for that class where for for 18 hours over a weekend, I debate the mi minimum wage. 
And it's something, it's interesting because I don't think I'm for it, right? I don't think I'm for it, but I'm not like, I'm, I'm not so close minded that I can't listen. So it could be very interesting going there. Also, Harvard's liberal. Harvard's a liberal school, so it'd be very interesting where if I went in, I'm like, wait, I'm an entrepreneur, right? I'm not going to pay a guy that's gone through grad school, right, and some guy that hasn't completed college. I'm not going to pay them the same amount of money. The guy that didn't go to grad school is not going to get $25 an hour to flip a hamburger, right? Um, all of a sudden, there's no incentive to get a degree or something, whatever. So uh, it'd be very interesting to go out there with somewhat of an opinion and learn what I can about both sides. But I, I can tell you from my, my personal experience using graphs and charts and stuff as an economist, every time the government comes in to fix something, like it's not fair for the poor person to earn so little money. It screws everything up. It every time it's a, it, it there are unintended consequences that are makes everybody worse off. In particular, the person they're trying to help. So I'm like, really? I got to pay you twenty bucks to make French fries? F you! you I'm not going to hire you. Great. So now, if I if you had a job, you'd have. Twenty dollars an hour, except you don't have a job. So I don't know if that's. I mean, I can I can draw it on a graph and all that kind of stuff. But I I can kind of. So it'd be great to debate that for eighteen hours with a bunch of smarty pants. Huh? The problem is they talk too much. Look at me. The funny thing is, as soon as I turn this webinar off, I probably won't say three words for the rest of the day. So you uh, you motivate me. So thank you guys. So I think I'll uh, I think I'll jump and uh, wish you a great weekend. Uh, yeah, yeah, but Jim's right. All of a sudden, because I've seen it, I've seen a McDonald's restaurant that has a robot that makes French fries. It dumps, it measures how hot the oil is and when it's ready. It dumps frozen fries in there, cooks it for a certain amount of time, picks up the basket, goes. Tch, tch, Get the excess oil up, and then it goes, and it dumps, and salt goes on it. No human touches anything ever for the entire day. Yeah, and you don't have to drug test the guy, you know, the, the robot, every three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, don't buy Yeah, I got it. So anyways, so that you know, maybe it's better to pay someone 10 bucks an hour to do it. Yes, I will, Lester. So so anyways, have a wonderful weekend. Um the server's being upgraded for FX boot camp, and when that's done, then we can we can fix and tweak and everything that needs to be on FX boot camp. Uh we're gonna launch a new service. Uh if if you need it, we're here for you. Um and uh, I'm going to add some new courses, update some few things. Everything should be good in the, the hood. And probably uh, Feb 1st, if everything goes well, we can start doing like monthly pivots together, weekly pivots together, um, London session together, New York session together, uh, daily, daily training updates and stuff, and all that kind of beautiful, beautiful things if you want to get smarter faster. So, peace on earth, may the pips be with you, may our profits be above average. Cheers. I'll see you in Nepal. I'll get you a Kathmandu. Cheers.